Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to Raven's Readings. This is Chapter 7 of The Inimitable Jeeves by P.G. Woodhouse. I'll be reading from this book on Tuesdays and my own stories on Fridays. In the last chapter, we saw how much Bertie Wooster missed having Jeeves to help him. We will now meet Bertie's cousins, Claude and Eustace, definite troublemakers. If you subscribe to my newsletter, you'll get notified of my updates as soon as they're ready. If you enjoy this reading or have other classics you'd like to hear, leave me a comment. Chapter 7. Introducing Claude and Eustace. The blow fell precisely at 1.45 summertime. Spencer, and Agatha's butler, was offering me the fried potatoes at the moment, and such was my emotion that I lofted six of them onto the sideboard with the spoon. Shaken to the core, if you know what I mean. Mark you, I was in a pretty enfeebled condition already. I had been engaged to Honoria at Glossop nearly two weeks, and during all that time not a day had passed without her putting in some heavy work in the direction of what Aunt Agatha had called molding me. I had read solid literature till my eyes bubbled, we had legged it together through miles of picture galleries, and I had been compelled to undergo classical concerts to an extent you would hardly believe. All in all, therefore, I was in no fit state to receive shocks, especially shocks like this. Honoria had lugged me round for to lunch at Aunt Agabus, and I had just been saying to myself, Death, where is thy jolly old sting, when she hove the bomb? Bertie, she said suddenly, as if she had just remembered it, what is the name of that man of yours, your, uh, your valet? Eh? Oh, Jeeves. I think he's a bad influence on you, said Honoria. When we are married, you must get rid of Jeeves. It was at that point that I jerked the spoon and sent six of the best and crispiest sailing onto the sideboard, with Spencer gambling after them like a dignified old retriever. Get rid of Jeeves, I gasped. Yes, I don't like him. I don't like him, said Aunt Agatha. Oh, but I can't. I mean, why, I, I couldn't carry on for a day without Jeeves. You will have to, said Honoria. I don't like him at all. I don't like him at all either, said Aunt Agatha. I never did. Ghastly what? I'd always had an idea that marriage was a bit of a washout, but I never dreamed that it demanded such frightful sacrifices from a fellow. I passed the rest of the meal in a sort of stupor. The scheme had been, if I remember, that after lunch I should go off and caddy for Honoria on a shopping tour down Regent Street, but when she got up and started collecting me and the rest of her things, Aunt Agatha stopped her. Oh, you run along, dear, she said. I want to say a few words to Bertie. So Honoria legged it, and Aunt Agatha drew up her chair and started in. Uh, Bertie, she said, dear Honoria does not know it, but a little difficulty has arisen about your marriage. By Jove, not really, I said, hope starting to dawn. Oh, it's nothing at all, of course. It's only a little exasperating. The fact is, uh, Sir Roderick is being rather troublesome. Oh, thinks I'm not a good bet? Wants to scratch the fixture? Oh, well, perhaps he's right. Pray do not be so absurd, Bertie. It is nothing so serious as that. But the nature of Sir Roderick's profession, unfortunately, makes him uh, overcautious. I didn't get it. Overcautious? Uh, yes, I, I suppose it is inevitable. A, a nerve specialist with his extensive practice can hardly help taking a rather warped view of humanity. I got what she was driving at now. Sir Roderick Glossop, Honoria's father, is always called a nerve specialist because it sounds better, but Everybody knows that he's really a sort of janitor to the loony bin. I mean to say, when your uncle the Duke begins to feel the strain a bit, and you find him in the blue drawing room sticking straws in his hair, well, old Glossop is the first person you send for. He toddles round and gives the patient the once-over, talks about overexcited nervous systems, and recommends complete rest and seclusion, and all that sort of thing. Practically every posh family in the country has called him in at one time or another, and I suppose that, being in that position, I mean constantly having to sit on people's heads while their nearest and dearest phone to the asylum to send round the wagon, well, does tend to make a chap he take what you might call a warped view of humanity. You mean he thinks I may be a loony, and he doesn't want a loony son-in-law, I said? 
and Agatha seemed rather peeved than otherwise at my ready intelligence. Uh, of course, he does not think anything so ridiculous. I told you he was simply exceedingly cautious. He wants to satisfy himself that you are perfectly normal. Here she paused, for Spencer had come in with the coffee. When he had gone, she went on. He appears to have got hold of some extraordinary story about you having pushed his son Oswald into the lake at Ditteridge Hall. Incredible, of course. Even you could hardly do a thing like that. Well, I, I did sort of lean against him, you know, and, and, and he shot off the bridge. Oswald definitely accuses you of having pushed him into the water. That has disturbed Sir Roderick, and unfortunately has caused him to make inquiries, and he has heard about your poor Uncle Henry. She eyed me with a good deal of solemnity, and I took a grave sip of coffee. We were peeping into the family cupboard and having a look at the good old skeleton. My late Uncle Henry, you see, was by way of being the blot on the Worcesterest cutchin. An extremely decent chappy, personally, and one who had always endeared himself to me by tipping me with considerable lavishness when I was at his school, but there's no doubt he did at times do rather rummy things, notably keeping eleven pet rabbits in his bedroom and I suppose a purist might have considered him more or less off his onion. In fact, to be perfectly frank, he wound up his career, happy to the last, and completely surrounded by rabbits in some sort of a home. It is very absurd, of course, continued Aunt Agatha, if any of the family had inherited poor Henry's eccentricity. It was nothing more. It would have been a Claude and Eustace. There could not be two brighter boys. Claude and Eustace were twins, and have been kids at school with me in my last summer term. Casting my mind back, it seems to me that Bright just about described them. The whole of the term, as I remembered it, had been spent in getting them out of a series of frightful rows. Look how well they're doing at Oxford, she said. Your Aunt Emily had a letter from Claude only the other day, saying that they hoped to be elected shortly to a very important college club called the Seekers. Seekers? I couldn't recall any club of the name at my time of Oxford. What do they seek? Uh, well, Claude did not say. Uh, truth or knowledge, I should imagine. Uh, it is evidently a very desirable club to belong to, for Claude added that Lord Rainsby, the Earl of Datchet's son, was one of his fellow candidates. Uh, however, we are wandering from the point, uh, which is that Sir Roderick wants to have a quiet talk with you quite alone. Now I rely on you, Bertie, to be, I won't say intelligent, but at least sensible. Don't giggle nervously. Try to keep that horrible, glassy expression out of your eyes. Don't yawn or fidget. And remember that Sir Roderick is the president of the West London branch of the Anti-Gambling League, so please do not talk about horse racing. He will lunch with you at your flat tomorrow at one thirty. Please remember that he drinks no wine, strongly disapproves of smoking, and can only eat the simplest food, owing to an impaired digestion. Do not offer him coffee, for he considers it the root of half the nerve trouble in the world. Oh, well, I should think a dog biscuit and a glass of water would about meet the case. What? Bertie? Oh, all right, uh, Mary Persiflage. Uh, now that's precisely the sort of idiotic remark that would be calculated to rouse Sir Roderick's worst suspicion, she said. Do please try to refrain from any misguided flippancy when you are with him. He is a very serious-minded man. Oh, are you going? Well, please remember all I have said. I rely on you, and if anything goes wrong, I shall never forgive you. Oh, righto, I said, and so home with a jolly day to look forward to. I breakfasted pretty late next morning and went for a stroll afterwards. It seemed to me that anything I could do to clear the old lemon ought to be done, and a bit of fresh air generally relieves that rather foggy feeling that comes over a fellow early in the day. I had taken a stroll in the park and got back as far as Hyde Park Corner when some blighter sloshed me between the shoulder blades. It was young Eustace, my cousin. He was arm in arm with two other fellows, the one on the outside being my cousin Claude and the one in the middle, a pink-faced chappy with light hair and an apologetic sort of look. Bertie, old egg, said young Eustace affably. Hello, I said, not frightfully chirpily. Fancy running into you, he said, the one man in London who can support us in the style we are accustomed to. 
Oh, by the way, you've never met old Dogface, have you? Dogface, this is my cousin Bertie. Lord Rainsby, Mr. Worcester, we've just been round to your flat, Bertie. Bitterly disappointed that you were out, but were hospitably entertained by old G's. That man's a corker, Bertie. Stick to him. What are you doing in London? I asked. Oh, buzzing round. We, we've just up for the day. Flying visit, strictly unofficial. We oil back on the 310. And now, t touching that lunch you very decently offered to stand us, which shall it be? The rich, Savoy, Carlton, or if you're a member of Ciro's of the embassy, uh, that would do just as well. I can't give you lunch. I've got an engaged myself. And by Jove, I said, taking a look at my watch, I'm late. I hailed a taxi. Sorry. It's man to man, then, said Eustace. Lend us a fiver? I hadn't time to stop and argue. I unbelted the fiver and hopped into the cab. It was twenty to two when I got to the flat. I bounded into the sitting room, but it was empty. Jeeves shimmied in. Sir Roderick has not yet arrived, sir. Good egg, I said. I thought I should find him smashing up the furniture. My experience is that the less you want a fellow, the more punctual he is bound to be, and I had a vision of the old lad pacing the rug in my sitting room, saying, oh, He cometh not, and generally hotting up. Is everything in order? I fancy you will find the arrangements quite satisfactory, sir. What are you giving us? Cold consomme, a cutlet, and a savoury, sir, with lemon squash ice. Well, I don't see how that can hurt him. Don't get carried away by the excitement of the thing and start bringing in coffee. No, sir. And don't let your eyes get glassy, because if you do, you're apt to find yourself in a padded cell before you know where you are. Very good, sir. There was a ring at the bell. Stand by, Jeeves, I said. We're off. The end. Well, I'm wondering how smoothly this meeting will go. Bertie seems to have a knack for putting his foot in it. Next Tuesday, I'll do another in this series. Stay tuned for Chapter 8, Sir Roderick Comes to Lunch. If you subscribe to my newsletter, you'll get notified of my updates as soon as they are ready. If you enjoy this reading or have other classics you'd like to hear, leave me a comment. Check out my other posts on my substack at ravensview.substack.com and remember to share this with your friends. Ta-ta for now.